Today, we will start the lecture with discussing how to calculate the elastic constants. And uh, the one obvious method how to do this is using ab initio or atomistic methods in which you can create an atomistic model of your system, you can deform it, and then you can observe what happens with the material. Is what happens you can describe with two different uh, ways. Either you monitor the resulting stresses or you monitor the resulting increase of the total energy. Both of these things can be done once again on the quantum mechanical level using ab initio calculations or at the uh, atomistic simulations level using, for example, molecular dynamics. So if you have access to the stresses, then you do something similar what you would do in experiment. Similar because in experiment, you are likely to, uh, to apply force and measure displacement. In simulations, it is easier to prescribe displacement, to prescribe deformation, it means prescribe the strain and measure calculate the resulting stress. If we do this for a certain deformation mode, we get a set of stresses. The index I or J here represents the Voigt's notation. So both of these objects which are circled here are six by one vectors. The alpha represents the fact that I prescribe a certain deformation. Maybe this is a tetragonal deformation, tetragonal elongation by 2%. Maybe this is a hydrostatic pressure, hydrostatic deformation. Whatever you decide, for a given strain, you get a given stress. And those are related via the matrix of elastic constants, compliances, uh, sorry, the stiffnesses, are uh, the Hooke's law. So here we have the linear Hooke's law. All right. Um, this one pair of forces, stresses, in the formations, the strains, do not fully determine the elastic matrix, the, const the, the matrix of elastic constants. We have simply two equations, oh, sorry, two, six equations, Right, so for uh, each of the sigma one, sigma two, and so on. Uh, for each of the, or for each of the sigma, we have one equation uh, which then relates um, calc relates the component of the stress tensor to a linear combination of the components of the matrix of elastic constants uh, with the strain tensor. Even if we apply the known relationship that the matrix of elastic constants is symmetrical with respect to the main diagonal, we still do not have enough equations to fully determine the, uh, the, compo the components of this six by six matrix. Maybe we would have that in some special cases when we say we have a cubic material and therefore there are only three unknown values of this uh, elastic constants matrix. Or if you say we have isotropic material and therefore there are only two unknown values. But in general case, we have too few equations to determine up to 21 independent components of the matrix of elastic constants. So what we have to do? Well, we need to get more equations. How do we get them? We simply apply a different deformation, get a different set of stresses. They are related once again by the same matrix of elastic constants because it is the same material, right? And this way I generate more and more and more relations between stresses and strains, different stresses, different strains, always connected with the same matrix of elastic constants. <clears throat> 
So what I can do is that I now arrange the stresses. I write it this way, because C, I, J, epsilon one. Epsilon one. I can arrange them in a matrix form. I can do the second type of deformation and have the second column of the stresses. I apply a third type of deformation and get the third type of stresses. Now those are individual columns, right? columnar vectors, all of them related with the same matrix of elastic constant. So when I arrange now those as really columns of matrices, label this as S and this as E, then the matrix of elastic constants can be calculated as S times the inverse E. This is so-called stress strain method. Obviously, what you can do is that you can apply 100 deformations, get 100 stresses. You have, in fact, 600 equations that determine the components of this CIJ matrix. You over-determine your program. Uh, you have too many equations. In ideal case, those would be linearly dependent. In practice, when you do the calculations, they will not be. They will not be because of accumulation of numerical errors or because your material that you're describing is truly nonlinear in the regime. If I double the strain here, I should get twice as large stress here. Whether the components of the stress for a scaled strain are exactly double the values of the original stress, well, this is strongly dependent on the numerical accuracy of my methods, be it up initio, be it uh, MD simulations, whatever I apply. And for that reason, I will get that sigma one and epsilon one and two sigma one, actually sigma, or epsilon two, which is equal to two epsilon one, sigma two is not exactly equal to two sigma one. I'm likely to get it this way. In that case, I will not be able to calculate the simple inverse of this matrix. And thereby, I need to calculate so-called pseudo inverse. In other words, my matrix of elastic constants will not absolutely perfectly fulfill the relationship that I have here, it will not fulfill the Hooke's law. Because for doubling the strain, I should get a different, slightly different stress. This is how it should work. So what I need to do in the pseudo inverse is that I find a matrix which minimizes the residue. So if I then have for each uh, stress, I get the predicted stress based on the strain. Now I need to minimize all those, oh, sorry, there should be C, right? For uh, different alphas. This is what is the principle of the pseudo inverse. Right, so the matrix will be minimizing this, uh, uh, this difference. In other words, we are searching for a matrix which best describes the given data set which should relate stress and strain. Unfortunately, not always you have access to the stress. What, however, you always have access to in those methods, both uh, DFT and atomistic methods is the total energy. Now, if you deform material, you otherwise do not change anything else, then the change of the energy can be interpreted as the accumulated strain energy. And since the strain energy, we know how it is related to the matrix of elastic constants, it is simply a quadratic form of the strain with the matrix of elastic constant being the coefficients of this quadric. Then we can apply again many different strains, fit those 
and from those fits, uh, try to estimate the elastic constants. In ideal world, the estimations from here and from here should be identical. In practice, there will be numerical inaccuracies, which might lead to slightly different uh, values, slightly different we probably talk about differences in the range of 1% inaccuracy. <clears throat> so once we know how to calculate the matrix of elastic constants, we also may want to have a look into the literature, into some engineering tables for values. And most often what we find is that the materials would be described uh, in an approximation of isotropic medium, means uh, there will be provided two elastic constants to fully describe the material as an isotropic medium and as an approximation to the real material. However, there are plenty of different elastic constants and moduli and since for isotropic medium, you need only two, there must exist relationships between them. And I really like this table taken from Wikipedia, which for a given, of, given pair of parameters, be it Young's modulus and shear modulus, for example, be it bulk modulus and shear modulus, or Young's modulus and Parsons ratio, whatever you decide are the two parameters that uh, you know for your azeotropic material, you have here the relations, how all other quantities are then calculated from those two uh, isotropic elastic constants. So for example, here we have the formula for the bulk modulus corresponding to Young's modulus and Parsons ratio for an isotropic material. Right, I'll leave this example away. Essentially, uh, that was a demonstration that has been done normally in the classroom or if you're not in a classroom as a homework to apply all the knowledge that you have to solve such a bimetal uh, strip problem where you apply a temperature change because of the temperature change you would generate in each of these materials independently different elongation, the thermal strain. Now, when you say in the bimetal, these two stripes must remain connected, means the overall elongation must be the same for both of those uh, pieces with different thermal expansion. You will essentially deform both of them. One would be put in tension, one would be put in compression. And you have now all the tools already to calculate what would be the resulting bimetal lengths simply by minimizing the strain energy. This is the most convenient configuration. I'm not going to do it here. You can try to do that if you want to. Um, this first, uh, first task where you should assume that the strip does not bend uh, is probably a little bit academic, but you can imagine it then as a trimetal where you would have three layers, make it symmetrical. And here you have H1 half, alpha one E1, H2 alpha two E2. And in the bottom layer, you have the second half of the first layer. Right? Such situation is obviously symmetrical with respect to the horizontal axis. And therefore, such a sample would neither bend upwards or downwards. And you would end up in exactly the situation that we have here that we should assume that the strip, this bimetal strip does not bend. So it is not only a hypothetical example, which doesn't make sense. No, it actually corresponds to such situation. Young's modulus. Young's modulus is a very important uh, mechanical property, quantity that is very often uh, described. 
Very often we would be given Young's modulus as a single number, as a scalar, what we spoke about in one of our earlier lectures. But we also know that for most of the materials, I would tend to say for pretty much any material, uh, this quantity is directionally dependent. What actually it is, I take a sample and I apply force. If I have a cross section here, A0, A0 is the, is the uh, area of this cross section, then the stress in the direction psi is sigma psi is f over a0. Young's modulus relates this stress to the deformation in the psi direction. So we are asking upon this action of the force, how much does the whole length change? from L0 to L. So now this is going to be L minus L0 divided by L0. This is the elongation in the xi direction, which is in the same direction as the acting force. We do not... Uh, speak, we do not quantify the change of the dimension in the perpendicular directions, so-called Parsons contraction. This is not what we are doing in the evaluation of the Young's modulus. All what we are interested in is to say that we apply force, we apply stress only in one direction. That means all other directions, all perpendicular directions are stress-free. And we monitor the elongation in this direction. Good. That's easy to say when we have cubic material and we elongate it in such direction. Right? But now, what if we are interested in elongation in the 110 direction or in the one, one, one directions. Or if our material is not cubic at all, what if we speak about hexagonal material, right? So what we are going to do is that now the direction of interest, in which we want to apply the force, which is given by a vector L1, L2, L3. So this is the direction in our laboratory system, in which we know how the crystal is oriented. This direction, we now rotate in a different direction in a prime coordinate system where this vector will become one, zero, zero direction in a prime system, O, X prime, Y prime, Z prime. Right? So this is the idea of it. So there we have it here. Once you do that, you will then have essentially only one non-zero component of the stress, only sigma one one. All other components in this coordinate system, this primed coordinate system are zero because we have the force acting only along this direction. And then if we manage to calculate the strain component one one in this direction, then we are basically done. We can use the compliances to relate the strain tensor to the stress tensor. And since all other components, but one, one component of the strain tensor in the prime coordinate system are equal to zero, this double sum, this double sum over indices i and j yields only one non-zero component, and that is S prime, one, 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 sigma, one, one, and primed. And this, this part 
cancel out and we get simply that the Young's modulus in the direction L is an inverse value of the 1111 component compliance tensor in a coordinate system where the in axis one is rotated in the direction of interest. So now maybe for the first time you see some point of all of this matrix juggling and matrix transformations we've been talking about here a lot at the beginning. Uh, what we do now is that we apply this transformation, calculate the S111 component of the compliance tensor, invert it simply, and we have the Young's modulus. We can do this for any direction we want. I will not go through these equations here. You have them in your slides and you can uh, have a look at it. You see that we are you. Sorry, where are we? Almost there. We are conveniently using here the fact that we are in the orthonormal system. That means uh, we use the relationship between the inverse and transpose matrix, the transformation matrix. And finally, when we put all of that in the equations, we end up with such an expression for the uh, Young's modulus or inverse value of the Young's modulus depending on the direction of the application. Now, those values, they are simply the directional cosines corresponding to our given direction, to the vector L1, to the vector L. So those are L1, L2, L3 values. Those would correspond to the uh, A11, A12, and A13. We have already used in here the fact that we have cubic material. So we have simplified those values that we know that those are identical in the cubic material. And we have also used the Foix notation here. Okay, so don't forget that while for the elastic constants, the Fox notation is straightforward, how to go from four to two indices. For the compliance matrix and compliance tensor, the relationship is more complicated. We have these additional factors, one half and one quarter. When you put all of this together, you finally come to the expression for the cubic materials. How is the Young's modulus in a given direction L? Once again, vector L, L1, L2, L3. How is it related to the compliance matrix components? You see that this is an easy analytical formula, and now you can visualize those simply by running through all values L1, L2, and L3 probably by keeping those as a normal vector, because that's the definition of the cosines here, then we can visualize the directional dependence of the Young's modulus. This is very often, okay. This is very often done by such a 3D pictures in which the distance from the origin to a given surface and probably also using the color code signifies the Young's modulus in a given direction. So for example, for aluminum nitride, we clearly see that the softest direction is along the, and we speak here about the cubic aluminum nitride. So the softest direction is along the 100 directions, whereas the stiffest direction is in the 111 directions. The opposite is true for titanium nitride, where we get the stiffest directions along the 100 directions, and the softest ones here would be along the 111 directions. If the resulting directional dependence of Young's modulus is directionally independent, that means the visualization yields pretty much a spherical shape, you have an isot uh, elastically isotropic material. Again, it does not mean that your material is amorphous or that it is 
structurally isotropic. No, we speak here indeed about the B1 structure, the rock salt structure, where the atoms are very, very clearly on a cubic FCC-like lattice with the nitrogen atoms sitting in the interstitial sites everywhere here. Right? So this is structurally completely non-isotropic material. It is clearly cubic material. But the elastic response here is elastically isotropic. So no matter in which direction I load it, I always get the same deformation. This elastic anisotropy is conveniently described and quantified by something called Zener's anisotropy ratio. For cubic materials, it takes this form. And if you think about it, this is exactly the deviation of the C4-4 component from what would be the value for isotropic materials. If you remember what we showed here last week about the shape of the six by six matrix of elastic constants, in which for isotropic materials, we said we have C11, 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 C12, 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 zeros everywhere here, right? And then on this uh, lower part of the main diagonal, the values would have been one half C11 minus C12 for isotropic materials. Well, this is exactly the value that we now calculate here. And we say how far away from this isotropic value is the actual cubic C44. So if the A as isotropic ratio is equal to one, it means C44 equals one half C11 minus C12, which is exactly the relation that should hold true for isotropic materials. So A equal one means elastically isotropic material a different from one means elastically anisotropic material, cubic material. Whether it's larger than one or smaller than one, then signifies which of the directions is the more, uh, is the more, is the stiffest. So for larger values, we get the one, one, one direction as the stiffest. For uh, smaller than one, we get the one, oh, oh direction as the stiffest. And we see here the value of yttrium nitride that we have here is very, very close to one. It is not exactly one. So indeed, the yttrium nitride is not perfectly elastic isotope, but it is very, very close to it. Now, though these colorful blobs are very sexy and nice for publications, uh, it's hard to read out the data out of them. And the data would be then be conveniently shown by showing the Young's moduli uh, in different important, crystallographically important directions. So here we have the values in the 100, 110, and 111 directions. And once again, look for yttrium nitride, elastically and isotropic material, the values are overlapping. They do not depend do not strongly depend on the direction uh, in which we measure the Young's modulus. Same is true here for lanthanum nitride, whereas for all other transition metal nitrides, we get the same type of behavior that the 100 direction is the stiffest, and the aluminum nitride is now the opposite one. There is the 111 direction, the stiffest. In this picture, we show that even experimentally, you can determine this uh, directional dependence of the Young's modulus. As soon as you correlate the directional Young's modulus with uh, indentation modulus for a nicely textured material, then you are going to load your material essentially in one direction by the force pretty much in one direction. As much as we can say that this can be related to a uniaxial loading, we can try to relate the resulting 
indentation modulus, which relates the deformation, the depth of the indentation with the uh, force acting on the indenter, we can relate it with the directional Young's modulus. And here we show a clear example of uh, this directional dependence. These red data points are experimental measurements of indentation modulus for chromium molybdenum nitride. And if you look just at one fixed composition here, we see that the experimental values can represent a large scatter of values, right? We can get really a very large difference in the measured value. Here it's something around 250 and close to 400 GPA. At the first sight, you might say that your experiment is that inaccurate, but that would be too bad. You might say that there is a huge microstructural different, uh, difference in your material. But maybe one of those materials is kind of polycrystalline, the other one is single crystalline, or that you have a lot of grain boundaries and fewer grain boundaries. It turns out that for those two particular measurements, the polycrystallinity, the uh, amount of grain boundaries was fairly similar. What, however, differed here is the preferred orientation of the grains. And one of those, and specifically the upper one, uh, corresponds to the grains when they grow from the substrate. This is now free surface, where they grow with a direction, preferred direction in the 100 direction. Those lower ones, the microstructure looks very similar. Again, we have the substrate, we have the columns, but now this direction is preferably one, one, one direction. And here we go. If I now come with an indenter and I load my material, I load it preferentially in one, one, one or one, oh, oh direction. This is what is seen in the scatter of this data. What comes from the uh, where this scatter of the experimental measurements uh, originates from. The lower data set is much more uh, better represented by Yang's moduli, directional Yang's moduli calculated for 111 directions, this material, whereas the upper data set is not perfectly represented, but corresponds much, much better to the Yang's moduli, directional Yang's moduli calculated for 100 direction. And so indeed the directional dependence of mechanical properties exists, it is there. As a counterpart to Young's modulus, which represents a uniaxial stress and uniaxial loading, I represent here slightly exotic mechanical property, mechanical modulus called area modulus of elasticity. For Young's modulus, we applied a force in a certain direction and we measured the elongation in this direction. Now we take the same sample and instead of this uniaxial force, uniaxial stress, we apply a biaxial stress. So we apply a stress which is perpendicular to the given direction and is the same stress in all directions. So the resulting stress is everywhere the same. Here we have in all of these directions, the same stress. What do we measure is the change of the area, cross-section area, uh, perpendicular to the direction to which all these biaxial stresses are perpendicular to. And this is then expressed, this relationship between the applied biaxial stress and resulting change of the area uh, is then described by the um, area modulus of elasticity. Obviously, it is again a quantity which would be directionally dependent 
Now n describes the normal to the plane at which we act with this biaxial stress and where we measure the change of the area. It can be shown that for cubic materials, this area modulus of elasticity is related to the Young's modulus in a direction perpendicular to this plane and uh, the bulk modulus. Bulk modulus is the elastic response of a material to an applied hydrostatic stress. Therefore, the spatial distribution of the area modulus is going to be same as the spatial resolution of uh, distribution of the Young's modulus, simply because the bulk modulus is a quantity which is directionally independent. We have, uh, we have pressure. Pressure is the stress which is in all directions the same. We have so-called uh, hydrostatic stress. This is pressure. And therefore, the bulk modulus can be in this graphical representation represented by, uh, by a sphere. It is a single valued quantity. This fact that the 3D representation or the, the directional dependence of those two quantities is identical is represented on this example of a lot of different topologies of Young's moduli, all of those for different nitrides from, let's say, more uh, standard way, more standard distribution. We know already those two type of blobs to a more extreme type of distribution where we have extreme differences between some directions, the 111 as the softest and the 100 as the stiffest, to very, very extreme to essentially distributions which are at the border of stability. The Young's modulus in one of those directions is extremely small. And small Young's modulus means that a deformation in such direction does not cost you any energy. That means your material can be elongated without inputting any energy, without doing any work. And this is a sign for elastic or mechanical instability. Then when you look here, the spatial distribution of area moduli, they are the same as the Young's moduli. Let us briefly come to polycrystalline values. If you look into the literature, very often people state that they calculated polycrystalline mechanical properties, atomistic people like me. What are those? Of course, we can't calculate polycrystalline materials. What we can calculate is a single crystal and then do a certain averaging of these directional dependencies of Young's moduli. There are two types of such averages. One is called Foigt estimation, Foigt type of estimation, in which we apply to all of our single crystalline grains, we apply the same deformation. All of those are subjected to the same strain. When I apply a strain to my aggregate of grains in Foigt's limit, then I say that all of those grains, independent of their actual orientation, crystallographic orientation, they have the same strain. Now, because they are not isotropic, the resulting stress in individual grain depends on the actual orientation. And therefore, the macroscopic stress that I will measure, stress acting on my polycrystalline uh, aggregate, will be an average of the stresses of all of those materials. This average part comes from the fact that we deal here with e-linear elasticity. I can come also to the other extreme, where I would say that now all my grains experience the same stress, 
independent how it is oriented, all the grains experience the same stress. But again, using the same argument as before, then they do not have the same strain. They cannot have because they are not elastically isotropic. And so each of these grains would be differently deformed, some of them more, some of them less. And the macroscopic strain that I measure for this aggregate of grains will be an average, an ensemble average of all of those aggregates. Now for Feucht and Troy's estimates, I, immediate, I, I say that we indeed talk about the uniform strain or uniform stress over the whole ensemble. If you see this in a paper, if you see this in a publication without any further details, then what is assumed is that the ensemble of your grains contains all orientations with the same probability. It means I do not have any preferred grain orientation. All of them are there. We do not consider here at all any crystalline shape. We do not consider any texture. We know what texture is. Right. Then, in order to provide a single value, because of course, when I go to lab and measure it, measure Young's modulus or shear modulus of my material, I would have single value. We simply average those two values, the Royce and Foyt estimates. The idea behind this is to say, well, those are two extremes and the reality is probably somewhere in between. And this is called the Hill's average or Hill's estimate of the elastic constants. A side note here, for cubic materials, the resulting bulk modulus of Foyt and Troyes is the same and is the same as the single crystalline value. So for cubic materials, there is no difference whether we speak about the Foyt and Troyes values. And second note, this may be not so clear from what I have said here, the point that we have all orientations present with the same probability leads to an ensemble which will have macroscopically isotropic elastic response. That means I will eventually describe my material using only two elastic constants. The third one can be calculated out of here, right? When we know that this is one half minus C12. The same thing for the Royce. Again, it is an elastically isotropic aggregate of grains. So then I indeed end up with only two elastic constants. If I do want to include the texture, I can do that using so-called orientation distribution function. Orientation distribution function uh, provides you with an additional information about how many grains of a given orientation are present in your ensemble. So for the elastic or isotropic aggregates on the previous slide, the ODF function is simply a uniform function for each orientation given by the three Euler angles, phi one, phi and phi two, so the crystalline orientation of my single uh, crystal, with respect to laboratory system, I would have the same probability, right? So the ODF would be a uniform function. If I do not have a uniform function and I have certain preference for some orientations, I do get peaks there. And of course, then that would give more weight on those elastic responses for the Feucht and Troyes estimates, I then again, from the fact that either I have uniform stress or uniform strain, here I have the uniform strain and here I have the uniform stress. From those facts, uh, I'm then averaging either elastic constants or elastic compliances. Hill average is a, once again, simply 
mean value of the Floyd and Royce limits. So how does this work with respect to the polycrystalline quantities? It's an image which is probably too large and it needs a few moments to load. There we go. There we go. So what do we see? Here and here is the same thing. This is just a contour plot of this 3D picture. What we have on the x-axis is so-called full width at half maximum of our uh, ODF function. The ODF function is done so that the 0001 directions are preferably contained. So those might be the orientations of the grains which are there with higher probability. On the y-axis here, I have so-called isotropic content. So I'm now adding, in addition to my single crystalline grains, also some isotropic material. And this isotropic material is intended to represent the volume fraction of grain boundaries. So if I have small grains and large disordered areas between the grains, grain boundary regions, uh, which have presumably isotropic elastic response, I will have higher isotropic content. If, on the other hand, I come to a perfectly single crystalline material, so I have no grains, uh, no grain boundaries, and essentially all the grains have exactly the same orientation, so the full width at half maximum is zero. All my grains have the same orientation. The distribution is just a single delta function peaked at one orientation. I come to this corner and here I would have now the Young's modulus E100 in the 100 direction because this is the orientation of my grains. On the other hand, this point here would correspond to a perfectly isotropic material. Uh, the uh, material which is represented by the uh, hills average of our polycrystalline aggregates. What we see from here, now I will probably wait again before the images load. What we will see here is that based on your real microstructure, depending uh, therefore on the misorientation of your grains, the amount of the grain boundary phase, and of course, then dependent whether you have chromium, uh, zirconium nitride or aluminum nitride, you can have really large differences between the resulting predicted values of Young's modulus. The differences in this particular case can be as large as 150 gigabytes, <laughs> gigapascal, sorry. So here we see the large differences going from, I don't know, 380 to 430 um, gigapascal, depending on the microstructure. The same thing is true here for aluminum nitride. Again, from, um, I don't know, 330 up to 420 values. So a huge spread of values. All of them calculated from single crystalline values, the same and identical single crystalline values for either chromium, uh, zirconium nitride or aluminum nitride. But this huge dependence is simply related to the texture that you have in the material. Da -da -da. So we need to wait for loading the figure and then we can move on. You have probably seen equations where you try to calculate or solve some problem, uh, even analytically. And you have uh, tried this, presumably in some mechanics exercises. And you have seen how different the expressions can be if you 
deal with isotropic, elastically isotropic material or elastically anisotropic, maybe cubic material. And so it is desirable to be able to provide a material which has a certain symmetry, maybe isotropic symmetry, but at the same time, the elastic response is as close to the cubic as possible. What do I mean by that is that if you now schematically say that your cubic material, let's say Young's modulus in the XY plane, which looks like this, you are now searching for a material that has a Young's modulus response, obviously spherical or uh, circular in, in a 2D, uh, but the differences in different directions, these inaccuracies are minimized. We do not want to have a Young's modulus, uh, sorry, uh, right, an isotropic material, which would everywhere hugely overestimate the response or hugely underestimate. And uh, to calculate this tensor of elastic constants with a desired symmetry is done by so-called projection of the elastic constants on higher symmetry. There is one more reason for doing that, for those of you who have ever tried to calculate elastic constants with the stress strain method, probably have realized that what you get out of calculation with this pseudo inverse has nothing to do with the desired crystal symmetry. Again, due to the uh, numerical inaccuracies. But eventually you want to provide for cubic material just one C11 value, right? You do not want to have C11, C22, C33 and say, well, my material is not perfectly cubic. No, the fact that it is not perfectly cubic is a consequence of numerical inaccuracies. So now out of the result that you obtained, you want to extract values that indeed follow the desired cubic symmetry, but at the same time are as close to the values that you actually calculated as possible. And, uh, these projections we have here now, uh, for example, the uh, expressions, what come for the cubic material. Here it is trivial and it gives you a simple uh, and false impression that to get the C11 value, which should be the same as C22, which should be the same as C33, of course, because of the cubic symmetry, you simply average the values that you get in your uh, non-cubic symmetric matrix of elastic constants. Well, it works this nicely for cubic materials. It doesn't work this simple for other symmetries. So when we see, for example, for isotropic symmetry, the values that you need to describe the bulk modules, for example, and shear modules as the two moduli describing fully the uh, elastic properties of isotropic material uh, are obtained with much more complicated formulae. Or even more obvious, this becomes for hexagonal materials, where one would be tempted to say that the C11, which is the same as C22 for hexagonal materials, is simply mean value of C11 and C22 that you get in your non-hexagonal symmetry matrix. And you see it is not. Here, this projection technique yields, uh, more, let's say, analytically more complicated formulae, the formulae which yield material with desired symmetry, but closer, now measured by this Euclidean distance, closer to the original uh, matrix of elastic constants with lower symmetry. More details on this can be found in this paper, a very nice and instructive paper with a lot of math where this is described. Could be a very nice topic for some of your presentations if you do not have a topic yet. Uh, very briefly, higher order elastic constants. Up to now, we've been talking about second order elastic constants re uh, represented by the fourth rank tensor of elastic constants. In fact, those are representing the linear relationship between the stress and strain, the Hooke's law. But 
this is our assumption that this relationship is linear. Right? It doesn't have to be linear. So if we now say that we do not know the elastic uh, relationship, but we know how the total energy changes with respect to the applied strain. So we can estimate the elastic energy as a function of strain. Now we can obviously write the Taylor expansion of this energy as a function of strain. If we cut the Taylor expansion after the second or after the quadratic term, we are in the linear elasticity regime. But we can also include higher order terms. And that would lead to sixth rank tensor of elastic constants or so-called third order elastic constants. Third order because they now have three indices and they depend on three components of the strain tensor. You can rewrite this easily also in such a form that actually if we stop the expansion here after the third uh, term, then we end up with uh, a correction of the second order elastic constants with applied strain. That means that applying strain leads to stiffening or softening of the elastic constants. They are not constants, but the constants are really stress or strain dependent. And this is what is expressed in the first place by this third order elastic constant, sometimes also provided in the literature. And they essentially provide the corrections to the second order elastic constants uh, for uh, reaching out of the linear elasticity. 